Good morning. Everybody all right? Good. It's been good so far, hasn't it? Man alive, it's all happening here. Yeah, great. Uh, as Mark said, my name's Gary. What's yours? No drink. Okay, you've got your names. Do you want to say about Exeter? Ah, very good. Well, I'm here uh, this weekend with my wife Sally. Sally's the beautiful woman in her flowery pink dress down there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We don't travel too much together, you know, Sally's the librarian at Regents Theological College, Elim's Bible College, and um, I, I'm away most weekends, and uh, if Sally didn't stay in our home church, they wouldn't even know we existed, you know, so, uh, so it's great this weekend to have Sal um, with me, I've been looking forward to it. And uh, also, Clive and Christina sit next to Sal, Clive's one of the leaders, Clive and Christina are two of the leaders at CCC here in Exeter, and we went to college together. Way back in the 70s, we were in teacher training college, and uh, myself, Clive, another one of our friends who lives in Derby, a guy called Dave, he used to call us the Trinity. <laughs> and uh, we had some great fun at college, and it was really where our, our, our Christian lives were really strengthened, wasn't it, mate? Where we really learned what it was to yeah. live for Jesus and walk with him and take some ground and all of that sort of stuff. So uh, it's been a few years since I've seen Clive and saw Dave yesterday, first time in 28 years. Wow. Where did that go? Just astonishing. So I've been enjoying the weekend so far. If you have a Bible with you, maybe you'd like to turn to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. If you haven't got a Bible, don't worry, I'll read it. But uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, really uh, a really well-known passage. In fact, Mark quoted from it earlier in, the, uh, in our meeting this, this morning. Uh, although he didn't know what I was going to preach on, so that always encourages me. So here we go, Matthew 9:35. <clears throat> this is what it says. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, yeah. but the workers are few. Yeah. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I just, um, I love that passage for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I love it is for the way um, Jesus set the disciples up. And they didn't even realize what was going on. It's great. So he says to them, when he sees all these people who were without God and without hope in this world, he said to his, his followers, he said, now listen boys, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So what I want you to do is to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And some of you will know that that phrase, send out, it's a very powerful word in the original language. It's actually linked to the same word that's used for casting out demons. So it's, it's like Jesus saying to them, ask the Lord of the harvest to, to catapult out, to kick out workers into the harvest field. They need to go, so pray for it to happen. You know, it has that strength about it. Now, just imagine, would you imagine with me for a moment that you had been one of his followers at that moment and you've just heard him say, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. Question, what would be the very next thing that you would do? Speak to me. I know we're in church, but you can speak to me. It's all right. What would you do? You'd have to go. No, what's he told you to do? He says, ask the Lord of the harvest. So what would you do? You'd ask the Lord of the harvest, wouldn't you? Yeah? Good, true, blue disciples. So you'd have gone away and you'd have prayed like this. Oh Lord of the harvest, send out workers into the harvest field, amen. Yeah. Yeah? Is that right? That's what he said. It's always good to obey Jesus, yeah. just a little thought. So, what I love about this, I love God's sense of humor, because you know when this was written, you know there were no chapters and verses, you know that came a lot later. The chapters and verses not inspired, okay, that bit. But if you, if you have your Bible there, you read on into chapter 10, which is the next bit. It tells you who, who all these disciples were. It gives you their, their names. But the next verse of any significance says this. Chapter 10, verse 5. These 12, which 12? The 12 who were praying. What were they praying? 
Oh Lord of the harvest, send out workers into the harvest field. These twelve who were praying, what does he say? He sent them out. Ha! <laughs> got you. Uh, got you. Yeah? The ones who were praying for workers to be sent out actually ended up being sent out. Why? Because there's a basic spiritual principle there. It's not what I want to talk about this morning. But 90% of the time, have you noticed that we are the answer to our own prayers? Yeah. Uh, we are the answer to our own prayers. So, uh, you ever pray God like this? Oh God, please save my next door neighbour. Not quite sure what their name is, Lord. Haven't spoke to them, but they're just on the other side of that wall. So, uh, oh God, please save my next door neighbour. Well, how do you think that's going to happen? How do you th- I mean, how do you think that's going to happen? Do you think that God is going to get so frustrated that he's going to float down a copy of, I was going to say, a copy of White Jesus, but actually, these days, he'd float down a copy of The Big Welcome um, onto, their, onto their front door, and they'd pick it up and say, oh, The Big Welcome, God loves me, and he cares about me, and he wants me to know him, oh, dear Lord, please, save my life. That's not how it works. We're the answer to our own prayers, aren't we? So our friends or our neighbours and work colleagues, they're going to get saved because uh, we pray and then we act. Or sometimes, you know, you've got a friend who's in the... Maybe a friend who's going on a mission trip. Or, you know, they're going to go away to Wyoming or, or Regents Theological College or something. And uh, you, so you're praying for them because you know they've got financial needs. Oh, God, please meet the financial needs of my friend. Yeah. And this little voice inside says, yeah, you know that savings account that's earning nothing and it's got five grand in it and you really don't need it. Yeah, I know about that, Lord, but please, would you provide for my friends? Forget that, Lord. Just see, we're often the answer, aren't we, to our own prayers? Yeah. You didn't yeah. seem to like that very much, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I love that. And uh, I, but I want to use this passage that we read together to talk about some foundations this morning uh, that need to be in our lives if we are to be effective in sharing our faith with our next door neighbours and our friends and our work colleagues and members of our family who might not know Jesus. Or actually anybody that we might meet, whether it's people we already know or people on the street or on the bus or on the train, wherever we meet them. What are some of the foundations that that are going to help us to be more effective in in this world in terms of being a witness? So um, a while ago, some time ago, I was at the gym because you wouldn't recognise that I've been in the gym with a body like this, but I do go to the gym. And I just finished working out, had a shower, and I'm in the changing rooms getting dry, and there was one other guy in the changing rooms and uh, his name was his name was mate because <laughs> they're all called mate all right mate how are you mate so you know so i've noticed when a woman goes to the gym you know she's oh look, there's sandra there's cynthia you know there's uh, well, it's a bloke thing isn't it you know mate so um so this guy's there and i think we've had one chat at one point about football or the weather or something uh, but that's all i knew about him and I'm just minding my own business. Suddenly, this guy turns to me and he says, Hey, I said, Yeah. He said, um, Do you know what? I've, I've been wondering what it's all about. <laughs> so I said, What? He said, You know, like life. What do you think life is all about? And I'm thinking, I can't believe this. Because, yeah. you know, at that moment, there was nothing about me to give me away as a Christian minister. I mean, I'm just standing there in my birthday, so don't even think about that. So <laughs> but, I mean, I was just getting dry, you know, just in the shower. So I'm gonna have, I don't have a cross tattooed on my shoulder or something, you know, or, or a dove, you know. Ten cops on a dove, you know. Well, I mean, none of that. I'm just minding my own business, and this guy is asking me about the meaning of life. So uh, I said to him, I said, um, well, um, I think I've got some answers, you know. He said, really? I said, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what, um, why, don't we, uh, why don't we get dressed <laughs> and uh, I'll buy you coffee and we could talk about it. He said, oh, that, that would be great. So that's what we did. We went out into the coffee lounge, having got dressed, and uh, we got a coffee, <laughs> sat down, and I discovered his name was Dave. And then we just got talking and I, I, I shared the story of how I, I became a follower of Jesus when I was 17, four years ago. And the difference that that has made in uh, my life. And I just told my story. I said, so Dave, does that make sense? He said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I need to find out more about this. What can I do? And I said, well, listen, at our church, we have this course that we run. It's about 10 weeks long. 
uh, around food and discussion, uh, and it's called. Alpha. Of course it is, well done. <laughs> it's called Alpha. And uh, why don't you come along and you know you get a chance to ask lots of questions? So he did. Him and, his, uh, and he said to me, he said, "There's only one problem with coming, though." I said, "What's that?" He said, "Well, could I bring my wife?" So I went, oh. "Yeah, all right then." So <laughs> Dave and his wife Jackie both came on this Alpha course, and and shortly after that, they actually found a relationship with God, which is great. <laughs> Now, the reason why I'm telling you that story today is not to suggest here is a brand new way of reaching people for Jesus. Standing, changing rooms in the gym, in the nude, dripping wet, and wait for someone to ask you about the meaning of life. Because that doesn't happen very often, does it? But, but the point I want to make is this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said that a harvest is plentiful. And, and nothing's changed. In the year 2014, in the city of Exeter, the harvest is plentiful. There are people everywhere. Yeah? People everywhere. The problem has never been, never in 2,000 years, the problem has never been with the harvest. What's the problem? Workers. The workers are few. And probably more than at any time in our history, that's a big deal today. <coughs> in the Christian church because somehow we've bought into this lie that you can be a follower of Jesus without being a worker in the harvest field and this really strange sort of religious person has arisen in the church called consumer Christian yeah. consumer Christian who comes along uh, on a Sunday morning I'm not saying that there are any here today but it happens in a lot of churches Come along on a Sunday morning, sit in their, their seats, effectively say to the worship band and the pastor and the, the team of church, right, come on then, bless me, teach me, entertain me, give me the goods and services which I'm paying you for. That sounds a little bit stark, doesn't it? But the reality is that consumerism, one of the uh, overarching uh, parts of our culture today, probably the overarching sense of culture that we have, consumerism has even evangelized the church. It's evangelized the church. So we bought into that, not realizing that God doesn't call us primarily to be spiritual consumers. He calls us to be spiritual contributors. And it works out in all sorts of weird ways. Sometimes I go to a church and I'll be talking to somebody who's been in the church for decades. But when you chat with them and watch how they, how they live their lives around church meetings, it's pretty obvious that the posture they've taken on when they come in the doors is that of a guest. You know, you've welcomed some guests today and that was, that was wonderful, lovely. But they've been coming for decades, but they still see themselves as guests, you know rather than being hosts. That's weird, isn't it? Because this is their house. Yeah. This is their home. See, when Sally and I, when we have guests come to our house, we don't act as guests, it's our home. Yeah. We're the hosts. Yeah. So we tidy up. Yeah. We tidy up and yeah. put the coffee on, you know. We, Sally makes the most incredible scones. You know, we get all that ready, and people arrive, we welcome them, we make sure they're seated comfortably, we make sure they've got a drink, anything else that they need. And we're not thinking we're doing anything special. That's what you do if you're a host, yeah. don't you? That's what you do. We don't just leave the door unlocked and, and just sit there with the telly on. You know, we've invited people around. You know, hey, come in. You want to sit where you like. You know, kettle's in the kitchen. We don't do that because we're hosts. See? This consumer Christian thing, you can get us so easily. So what needs to happen? Here's the question this morning. We need to go quickly now. What needs to happen in, in my life, in your lives, if we are truly to be those workers in God's harvest field, particularly in this city and, you know, Plymouth and Torquay, great to hear those stories this morning, all that's going on. Here's a few thoughts. Number one, we have to have compassion for people. We have to have compassion for people. It says in that passage, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion yeah. on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And some of you will, some of you will know 
that when it says he had compassion on them, it literally means that he felt this gut-wrenching ache deep down inside. It was like, he, you know, he was aching inside. When he saw these people so far away from relationship with God, so far away from discovering their eternal destiny, so far away from actually knowing who God really is and experiencing his love and goodness and power in their lives, it says he had compassion. He was aching inside. So here's my question for you and me. How do we feel when we see the crowds? So you're going to walk out of here in a few minutes. It's a promise. <laughs> you're going to walk out of here and into the city, and there's crowds everywhere. We, we just drove in here about 10 past 10 this morning, and Sally said, God, there's people everywhere. It's only 10 past 10. Sunday morning, people everywhere. There's always crowds. But how do you feel when you see those people? You see, let me just be really honest with you. Most of the time, when I'm sort of leading my busy life and I'm around lots of people, I'll tell you how I feel about them. I don't feel anything. I don't, I don't feel anything. I'm just getting on with my life. Anybody else? No? Just being really honest with you this morning. Yeah. And, uh, and sad that I would actually be like that, actually. Because I want to be, I want to more and more have the heart of Jesus that sees people for who they really are, that sees past the facade. You know, the Bible says we look upon the outside, but God looks on the heart. He knows what's going on. He knows people's story. So God, help us to have the eyes of Jesus. When Jesus saw the crowds, the crowds, he had compassion on them. Help us, Lord, to see people the way that you see them. Because if we don't see them the way that Jesus sees them, we'll either feel nothing, or at worst, actually, we'll feel cynical about people yeah. and the way that they live their lives. I was, last year, I think it was, I was in the city, uh, the town, it's not a city, it's a town of Reading, uh, near London, west of London. That's where Sally uh, was brought up. And we were seeing family. But I was in town by myself, uh, just doing a bit of shopping, and I was heading for a pickup point where Sally was going to pick me up in the car. And I'm walking along the road, and there's a bunch of guys, about half a dozen guys, late teens, and they're drinking cans and stuff, um, alcoholic cans. And uh, as I'm walking by, one of them finishes a can and just throws it on the floor in the shopping area. Well, nothing gets me more than that sort of thing, you know? So I'm walking past, and I see this, this lad. He was, he, looked, he was probably about 19. He looked about 10. Yeah. You know? I mean, thin and weedy, and he finished this can, threw it on the floor, and I, thought, I saw him. And I was walking, I slowed down and I looked at him and I eyeballed him because I've not always been a Christian. You know? <laughs> and before I was a Christian, I wasn't in church or anything. I was a different life. I won't tell you all the details. It's embarrassing now. So I just, I sort of eyeballed him and he eyeballed me back. <laughs> Cheeky beggar. And he says, he said to me, he said, you got a problem, mate. I said, I thought, yeah, I got a problem. <laughs> you know. And then I realized I was uh, 55, and, uh, and there were six of them, and, uh, and I was actually supposed to be a man of God, <laughs> so, so I carried on walking. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And as I'm walking past, clear as anything inside, I felt the Lord say to me, uh, do you think that's how I feel about those lads? The Lord says, do you think that's how I feel about those lads? I don't know, Lord. I knew exactly. <laughs> I don't know, Lord. And I realized again that when Jesus looked at these guys, compassion. Compassion. And of course, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, whenever it says that Jesus had compassion on, on somebody or a group of people, it always meant he was going to do something to help them. It always meant that. I mean, you can't have Jesus type compassion and do nothing. Yeah? So, Lord, help us. Lord, help us with all of this. The good news is, the Apostle Paul says, Romans 5, that God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So what I need to be doing, he's not actually saying, oh, I've got to love people more, I've got to love people more, I've got to love people more. If I do that, I'll have a breakdown. What I need to be doing is saying, Holy Spirit, so fill me with the love of Jesus. That when my life gets not, what comes out of me is the compassion and love of Jesus for people around me. And that will cause me to act. So that's the first thing. <coughs> Find compassion. Have compassion. 
for people. Ask God to give you that sort of compassion for people. The second thing is this. We need to, I believe we need to, to find our security as human beings. Find that security in our relationship with God. So here's a question. What do you think is the number one reason why Christians find it difficult to share their faith with people who are not yet Christians? What's the number one reason? Embarrassment. Embarrassment, another word? Fear. Yeah, yeah. fear. Yeah, that's it. Embarrassment, fear. You know, fear of being rejected, fear of being misunderstood, fear of embarrassment, you know, fear of people thinking we're somebody we're not, all that sort of stuff. And of course, the one thing that fear does to us more than anything else is it paralyzes us. In whatever area we feel fear, we get paralyzed, we don't operate. So if you have this fear of being rejected by people, if you try and share your faith with them, then what's the one thing you don't do? You don't share your faith, see? And the issue is this, I think it's because, bottom line, we're all insecure. My name is Gary Gibbs and I'm really insecure. Anybody else? Okay, okay that's, that's seven of us. You've got a great church mark there. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing was, the rest of you are just liars. Because yeah. we're all insecure, aren't we? That's, that's the truth. Yeah. Unless we find a new security in our relationship with God. So this is what, again, back to the Apostle Paul. Um, Romans 8. Romans 8 is my, probably my favourite chapter in the whole Bible. I mean, it was John Wesley's as well, so I'm good grade. And this is what he says, Romans 8, 15, Paul says, you did not receive, listen to this folks, you, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit, capital S, the spirit of sonship or adoption. And by him, we cry, come on, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Now, some of you will be aware that word Abba is such a, an interesting word. It's got two basic meanings. First of all, it's the name of a 1970s Swedish pop band yes. that sang Waterloo and won the Eurovision Song Contest. But that's not where we're going this morning. We're going somewhere else. Many of you will know that that word Abba was the word that was used by children, Jewish children, to address their father. And the nearest word that we've got in English is Daddy. Daddy. Yeah, Daddy. Yeah. Except Daddy doesn't fully do it justice, and I'll, I'll explain why. You see, uh, a Jewish child, they would call their, their father Abba. But when those Jewish kids grew up into adults, they would still call their father Abba. Now, I've got three, three children, two sons and a daughter, and, uh, and more to the point, I've got three grandsons. And uh, how many of you know that grandchildren are God's gift to you for not killing your kids? Yeah. <laughs> Those are grandparents, so you'll know exactly what I mean. And, uh, but I, love, I do love my kids. And, um, and when my kids were small, <clears throat> Ben, Tom and Kate, <clears throat> they used to call me Daddy. Now that they're adults, they don't call me Daddy. They call me all sorts of other names. <laughs> uh, in fact, sometimes my daughter Kate, she, um, she does call me Daddy. And if she calls me on the phone and calls me daddy, I get really nervous. Do you know why? It's going to cost me money. I just know it's going to cost me money. And, uh, but they don't normally call me daddy, see? But a Jewish, a grown up Jewish person would still call their father Abba. The word never changed. And it's a word that's it's like it's pregnant with meaning. It's like, it's like they're, what they're saying is, uh, Abba, Dad, I know that you're for me. I know that you love me, not because of who I am, but often in spite of who I am. I know that you'll never let me down. You're kind, you're generous, you're caring, you're consistent. You are my Abba. And that's the word that Paul's using here. He says, you didn't receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. In other words, before you knew God, you were slaves to fear, all sorts of different fears. But he says, you received the spirit, the Holy Spirit of sonship, and he is the one who enables you to know God as Abba, and it changes everything. 
Yeah. Well, it changes everything if you know more than just the truth. How many of you know that it's possible to know the truth, but not know the truth of the truth? No. Did you hear me? Did you hear that? Okay. No. It's possible to know the truth, but not the truth of the truth. Right. Let me explain. So, if you're a Christian here this morning, if there's been a time in your life when you've made that decision uh, to give your life to Jesus Christ, to become a follower of Jesus, then God this morning, let me tell you, God is your Father. Because yeah. the Bible says it, doesn't it? The Bible <laughs> says to all who received Him, to all who believed in His name, God, in the name of Jesus, God gave those people the right or the power to become His children. John 1.12. Yeah? Yeah. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Not good enough. Not actually good enough. Okay? Because all that means is that you know the truth. You know, I made a decision X months or X years ago to follow Jesus, so God's my Father because the Bible says so. That will not help you when you're out in the big wide world and you have opportunity to share your faith. Because all you know is the truth. All you know is a doctrine. Yeah. Huh? What we need to know is the truth of the truth. So let me just illustrate what I mean. How many people here this morning, how many of you know that um, water is wet? Yeah. Okay. Anybody know that? Yeah. Okay. Now at this very moment, you know that as the truth, don't you? As a doctrine. Yeah? But if I pick up this bottle here, now and take the top off, and just come down here to Mark, and hold this bottle here. <laughs> it's the Bible, it's the Bible. I don't care, it's not the Quran, mate, it's not important. <laughs> the Bible's important, but you know, that sounded wrong, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I took this water and threw it all over Mark, see, you know the truth, water is wet. But he's just about to know the truth of the truth. Yeah? Because he'll know the wetness of water. That's different. I would never do it to him. He's my friend. How many of you would like me to do that to him? <laughs> you stinkers! <laughs> they didn't say anything, did you? <laughs> but you understand the difference. He would know the truth of the truth. Now, in a similar way, what God wants for us is not simply to know the doctrine that God is our Father. He wants us to know what it is to be living in the reality of, of being abbered by God. Yeah. Of being abbered by God. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Being li living in that reality of the experience, knowing that you know that God's your dad. Yes. He's your dad. And he's never going to leave you. He's never going to let you down. And sometimes when I'm in some hairy situations, I just have this picture in my mind that in the midst of that hairy situation when it's all looking a bit dodgy and a bit scary that God my dad is standing right next to me with his hand on my shoulder saying it's alright son, it's alright I'm right here anybody messes with you they mess with me, don't worry see, and that's where my security comes from yeah? otherwise there's no way I'd be doing this uh, there's no way I'd be standing in front of a bunch of people and talking, that would scare the living deadlines out of me but God's my dad and I know so we have to find our security there. Yes. I was in a, a garden centre two days ago having a coffee with a friend of mine who's also an evangelist as he happens. And uh, we were just sitting down to coffee. And I guess because we're evangelists, we've both got loud, big voices. You know? <laughs> and we're just having a laugh. You know, we weren't talking about God. We were just having a laugh about all sorts of things, waiting for a friend to arrive for a meeting. And there were a couple at another table. We were outside under a parasol. This couple in their mid-60s, they just finished their coffee and they walked over and the guy said, excuse me gents, uh, yeah? He said, where can I buy what you're on? Because <laughs> I want some of that. And Mark and I, my mate Mark, we looked at each other and we said, what do you mean? He said, you seem really happy. We said, we've got a lot to be happy about, you know. And we got into this conversation that went on for about half an hour talking about the Lord and, you know, and how Jesus had made the difference in our lives. And then Janet, who's come to me with the she arrived, so these, these folks left. About 10 minutes later, the guy comes back. He says, sorry to interrupt you. Um, he said, oh, you bought yourself another coffee? I said, yeah. He said, oh. I said, he said, I just came back to buy you a coffee. Because I just really enjoyed our chat. Yeah. And uh, I said to him, actually I said to his wife, I said, look, here's a little booklet what I wrote. <laughs> I said, well, don't you take it and have a read of it and see what you think. And she said, 
more than being welcome, experiencing God's welcome. Cool. Is that what he does? I said, that's exactly what he did. She said, thank you very much. Do you want any money for it? I said, yeah, that would be 17 quid. No, I said, I I said no, that's fine. So who knows? Who knows? The harvest is plentiful. We've just got to be secure. Or find our security in our relationship with God. Here's the last thing. I'm going to say a couple of things, but I'm just going to say one last thing. If we're going to be effective workers in the harvest field, we have to find our confidence in the gospel. Yes. We have to find our confidence in God's good news. Yes. So again, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 16, many of you know this, he says to them, he says, I am not ashamed yes. of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Amen? amen. Yeah, easy to say amen at half past twelve on a Sunday, isn't it? What about half past twelve tomorrow? I mean, tomorrow at this time, I don't know what you'll be doing this time tomorrow, maybe lunchtime, or who knows what you'll be doing, or who you'll be hanging out with. But, is the, but my question is this, is the gospel still the power of God to save that person in front of you this time tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah? Is the gospel still the power of God to make a difference in the lives of those people you're having a cup of tea with tomorrow? Or the people you see at the school gate in the morning? Or after that business meeting you've got coming up tomorrow? Is it still the power of God? You see, if we're really honest, some of us aren't sure. We're not sure. It's a bit different from being surrounded by your friends and your family here at River Church this morning, isn't it? Tomorrow, when you're out in the big wide world, just be honest about it. Yeah. And when you think about it, we believe some strange stuff, don't we? As yeah. Christians. And so it would be it would be natural in a sense to think, well, is this going to make any difference in people's lives? I mean, let me just remind you of what you believe. See, what you believe is. You believe that 2,000 years ago, in the back and beyond of the then known world, yeah. there was this small time Galilean preacher who said some things that the political authorities and the religious authorities didn't like very much, so they, they arranged to have him topped, you know, have him executed. And that happened, just like it did to thousands of people at that time, you know, crucifixion. And, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we're here this morning. <laughs> yes. Now, doesn't that sound a bit strange? I mean, doesn't that, sound, doesn't that sound a bit weird to yeah. you? Yeah. In fact, even more than that, doesn't it, sound, doesn't it sound foolish? How many of you are praying for the preacher now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Doesn't it sound foolish? What we believe. In fact, the Bible says that what we believe is foolish, doesn't it? The Bible says that the message of the cross is foolish to who? To those who are perishing. Yeah. In other words, to those women and men who've said, God, I don't want to go your way. I don't want to do your thing. I just want to do my own thing. I'm going in this direction. I'm going to please myself. I'm going to be the captain of my own destiny. I'm going to do it my way. Thank you very much. Goodbye, God. To those people, the message of the cross, it's foolishness. They don't get it. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, Paul says. But... But, says Paul, to those who are being saved, to those who've chosen to walk hand in hand with God and go this way, to those people, it is still the power of God. The message of the cross is still the power of God. So actually, ladies and gentlemen, let me just rewind a little bit and let me tell you what you really believe. See, what you believe is this. You believe that the God who created the whole universe, the God who made billions of stars and, and, and flung them out into space and commanded that they shine, and, and so they did because he commanded it. The God who created every planet in the universe, the God who created this planet, the God who created every mountain and every river and every stream and every ocean, the God who created every animal, giraffes, elephants, dogs, cats, don't build platypus. What was that all about, God? I think God was having a laugh. 
The God who created all seven billion people, seven thousand million people on this planet today, that God was not willing to stand on one side and watch us all walk away into an eternity without him. So he came to this planet in the person of his son Jesus, born as a tiny baby in the back of beyond and the then known world. And this Jesus grew up to show us exactly what God's like. Some of your friends say, say to you, well, who is God anyway? He's Jesus. If you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. Because Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he's a chip off the old block. Huh? He's a chip off the old block. And you look at Jesus and you find that God is a God of compassion and mercy and love and forgiveness and power. And he's a God with an incredible sense of humor. And he's a God who wants to be your friend. So we discover what he's like. And I'm here today to tell you that this Jesus who shows us what God is like was not willing to stop short of even hanging on a cross with big, with big pieces of metal hammered through his wrists and feet, dying slowly in the hot Palestinian sun, so that in some incredible way, through his death, he could take upon himself all of the blame for my wrongdoing, for my selfishness, for the, the accumulated rubbish in my life. Jesus on the cross took it all, took my shame, so I could know what it is to be forgiven by God for every wrong thing that I've ever done or said or thought. I could be forgiven for being the person that, I, that I've been. So because Jesus died, I could actually be reconciled to God. And it's as if that's not enough. I'm here to tell you this morning that this same Jesus who died for you, this same Jesus, today he lives for you. Three days after his crucifixion, God said, that's enough. And with his incredible power, he raised Jesus from the dead, smashing the power of death to pieces so that death is no longer the great enemy that we're hurtling towards at 100 miles an hour, this brick wall that's going to obliterate us no more. Because the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus is that the brick wall is turned into a thin curtain. Yeah. And one day, when I'm absent from this body, I'm going to be present with the Lord. Yeah. Because Jesus rose. Because Jesus has defeated death. And if that is not enough, I'm here this morning to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that because Jesus is alive in the world today, because he's here this morning by his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Jesus, he can invade our lives and turn bad into good, wrong into right, and recreate us into the men and women that God always intended we should be in the first place. He gives us the gift of a whole new life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if that's not good news for the city of Exeter and Plymouth and Torquay, I don't know what is. I don't know. We have got fantastic news. And I can't tell you how many times, whether it's been speaking to big crowds of people, speaking one or one, one with somebody, that this message of the gospel, has actually been the power of God that's transformed somebody's lives. I'm back to the gym. Yeah. So I'm in the gym one Saturday morning. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. And there's no one else in the gym at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Do you know why? Because they're all recovering from the night before. Yeah. So I'm the only one in there. And I'm on one of those bikes where you cycle away and you go nowhere. Do you know? Just warming up. There's one more person in the gym. His name's Andy. And uh, he's one of the instructors in the gym. He's sitting there reading the newspaper. And I'm cycling away. And I see Andy sitting there. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, do you know what, Lord? I'm willing to talk to Andy about you. I'm just not quite sure how to get into the conversation. So, Lord, if you just help me, I'll do it. But if not, I'm just going to work out. Amen. How many of you know God loves that sort of challenge? Yeah. And he's never short of an idea. So immediately I said, Amen. Bing! I knew exactly what to do. So I started this conversation with Andy, and uh, as we were talking, I said to him, because you know, you know I'm a minister, Andy, he said, you're not? I said, I am. He said, you're not. I said, Andy, I am. He said, 
you know, minister. I said, Andy, I know what I do. He said, you know. I said, Andy, if you say that again, I'll punch you. <laughs> I said, Andy, that's, that's what I am. And he said, that's amazing. I didn't think ministers look like you. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? And uh, so uh, he, said to, he said to me at the end of this conversation, he said, do you know what? I need to find out more about this. What can I do? And, um, and I said, well, um, where do you live? He said, I live in a place called South Normanton. I said, just north of Derby. And I said, uh, that's amazing. I said, I'm speaking there in two days' time at something called the event in the tent. I said, the, the church is doing this thing and, and I'm speaking there. Why don't you come along? I said, actually, one of the gladiators is doing some physical church. Do you remember? Gladiator was ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the gladiators who was a Christian was going to be there as well. So he turned up. I turned up two days later. There's Andy sitting on the back row chewing gum. You know, body language all over the place. And uh, the next day, I'm back in the gym, and he's there, and he came up, and he said, you know, last night, I said, yeah, he said, that was, he said, he meant really good, he said some other words, but he meant really good. And um, so, uh, so I said, yeah. I said, well, why don't you come tonight, I'm back there tonight. He says, yeah, all right then. So he came, now he's halfway forward in the tent, and he listens, and the next day I'm in the gym, and I see him, and he said, got to find out more about this, what can I do? I said, well, listen, we run this course. That's about 10 weeks. It's called Alpha. And there's one starting next week in your, in your big village, South Normanton. Actually, I, that was a bit of a lie, because the, the, well, I was prophesying, because there wasn't one, but there was going to be one. I just decided as I was talking. <laughs> so we started an Alpha course with me and a couple of other people in someone's home. And about five weeks into the Alpha course, I wasn't there, but Andy went to the Alpha course. And he said to the person who was leading here, before we do anything else, I need to do something. He knelt down on the carpet opened up this little evangelistic booklet to a prayer of the back, a prayer of commitment, and out loud prayed a prayer of commitment to Jesus. Amen. Gave life to Jesus. <laughs> and um, he went on to become a youth leader in that church, went on mission trips, on one of the mission trips, met a woman who's now his wife, and the rest is history. Just incredible. Yeah. So you never know, do you? But I want to tell you, I want to tell you this morning, and I want to encourage you to have confidence that this simple message that we think is too simple still has intrinsic power within it to change lives. It still does that for all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. And what we need, I guess, is God to download some fresh faith into our hearts. Yeah. Yeah? Because uh, faith comes as a gift. You know you don't work up faith, it's a gift from God, isn't it? Yeah. It's a gift. And I guess God's more committed to this thing than we are to give us confidence, faith, confidence to believe that the gospel can still work with our friends, with our neighbours, with our work colleagues, with members of our family that we were thinking about earlier in the service who don't know Jesus, that this message can still work. Is that okay? So I'm going to pray in a moment for you and then just walk off. But um, just a practical thing that you can do. Uh, to, to take this forward, because one of the, one of our problems in church is sometimes we listen to a message, walk out the door, and we forget what we heard. And James says that's like looking in a mirror, walking away and forgetting what you look like. Yeah. You know, crazy. So here's a little challenge. If you want to get one of those booklets from the from the uh, bookshop this morning, here's a little challenge. I know you won't all feel like you can do this, and that's fine. Don't get can't condemned about it. Just ask God to take it a step higher. But if you feel you can. Take a booklet this week and say to the Lord, Lord, I want to give this to somebody this week. I want to give this to somebody. And just do like this, say, hey, listen, you know I go to church, yeah? I was at church last Sunday. We had this big fat bull bloke speaking. <laughs> and uh, he issued us a challenge. It's called, uh, it's called the booklet challenge, the, or the big welcome challenge. He wrote this little booklet and he challenged us to get one of these, read it to ourselves. And if we thought it was okay, to give it to a friend to read and then ask our friend to tell us what they thought about it. That was the challenge. So, would you do me a favour? Would you read it for me? See what I mean? That's how you do it. See what? That's called being wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. You're not, you're not lying. I'm, not, I'm saying you can do that as a challenge. Is that okay? The downside is you have to buy it. Because uh, not so seventeen can't. quid. Is it? Seventeen quid each. To you, sir. Forty-two quid. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, there is a website for this, and they're the Baptist running because we did it together, me and my mate. And um, who's the Baptist uh, evangelism leader? So on the website they're one pound fifty, which is ridiculous because it's a little thin thing. So I bought a load. So from me, seventy-five p in ones, fifty p if you buy ten. In other words, five pound for ten. Don't misunderstand. 
and in hundreds, which you wouldn't do, but if people buy them in hundreds, they're 45p each, 45 quid. So they're available if you want them. But right now, I'd like to pray for you. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you for listening. You've been great. Nobody fell asleep. It's a miracle. Stand to your feet. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Get ready. Get ready for a gift of faith. Is that okay? Isn't it great? We don't have to work anything up, do we, with God? We can just ask Him. Because, you know, Jesus said, ask you, you receive. I believe that. So if I need more confidence and more faith to believe the gospel, and believe that God could use a little old me, I just ask and receive. Because he's generous. Remember, he's your Abba. <laughs> he's, not, he's not some celestial version of Colonel Gaddafi. Yeah? He's your dad. And dads are generous. Good dads are generous, aren't they? So he wants to bless, he wants to give. So Lord, we stand as your kids this morning. Father, we come to you. Uh, and thank you that we can approach the throne of grace uh, with confidence. Because it's a throne of grace. We deserve nothing, you give us everything. Thank you. So Lord, for me and for my friends here this morning, we're asking you for more faith, Lord. For fre a fresh gift of faith that we would actually believe more than we've ever believed in the power of the gospel, your good news, to change lives. After all, Lord, it changed our lives. It changed our lives. Why should it change the lives of people around us? So, Lord, we're asking you for more faith. We believe. Help our unbelief. Give us that gift. And even this week, Father, I want to pray practically you would just give us open doors of opportunity just to tell somebody some good news about Jesus. Not, not in some big preacher type way, just a, a sentence, a couple of sentences, maybe sharing our story of what you've done in our lives, that you would give us the opportunity in a really relaxed, obvious way to be able to do that. And I thank you for your promise, Jesus. You said, he who speaks the word of God, God gives him the spirit without limit. So as we speak your words to people, thank you that your Holy Spirit backs us up big time. Big time. Thank you that you're always ahead of the game. Thank you that you're always with us. And thank you for the way that you mop up after us as well. So, Holy Spirit, just instill faith afresh in our hearts. And help us to walk closely with you and to be your ambassadors. In Jesus' name, and all the people say, Amen. Amen.